Hafade and good evening everyone. The Committee on Public Safety will now reconvene this oversight hearing. Today is Wednesday, November 6, 2019 and it is currently 1715. For the record, in accordance with the open government law, public notices of this hearing were sent to all senators, stakeholders, and made media broadcasting outlets on Monday, October 28, 2019, and a second public no notice on Thursday, October 31, 2019. This hearing is a continuation of the October 9, 2019 Department of Corrections Oversight Hearing. The agenda for today's hearing includes the following items. Um, Guam Department of Corrections, organizational structure and operational procedures, erroneous releases of inmates or detainees, um, some of the issues that are the concerns that we had when we visited the halfway house, and the personnel. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that there are other people that would like to give testimony today. So I would like them to give their testimony first before we move forward with the leadership at DOC. Um, I will address, a, I sought guidance from our legal and there is a, um, there has been a letter circulated throughout the public with the Department of Corrections letterhead. And so we will address some of these items in this letter as well. Um, there is no one, there's no signing authority or no one that signed their name on this letter. So there's, um, there, it's difficult for us to really gauge the accuracy of this letter. So for the record, I'm asking that all personnel that have grievances um, and if they have any concerns they'd like to share, that they contact my office and we can meet with them and we can even assist them through the grievances process of the government. Um, Yes. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize my colleagues president, Senator Therese Terlahi, who is also the vice chair of the committee. Thank you for being here, and Senator Okay, We have with us today uh, quite a few on the roster. Christina Tovis, uh, DOC, Danielle Trisha Dolor, Teresa Tayama, Chaz Iglesias, Donna Cruz, Linda Antafaros, Vince, Menno, Sam, Sam Brennan, Julius Tano, Rebecca Conception, Joseph Carbolito, May Kitagua, Mike Kinata, Mayra, Mayra Davis. Do you know this name? The W. Windery. Wind Windery Benjamin. Forgive us if we got our name if you we got your name wrong. Ezekiel Palaco, Jonathan Ordinance, Gabriel K. Gonzaga, France Danielle Catalos, Kayla Kajigal, Canis, Kanisha Everett, Keith. Uh, Keith. Keith Petrichio, Jem Ann, Jem Ann Lagum Ann, and Janelle Faulkner. We also have Chanel, Venus, and Captain Lazama. If those would like to give testimony that are part of the public or part, uh, a part of DOC, can you please move forward? I'd like to ask the questions at the end to the deputy director and to the director themselves. Is there anyone that'd like to give testimony? No? Okay. Do you have a statement prepared, Director? Deputy Director? No statement? Okay. Then I'll just read this letter. So this is the letter with the Department of Corrections letterhead. So we'd like to read the concerns on this letter for the record. Half a day, we the concerned managers and employees of the Department of Corrections are hereby writing this letter to bring to light the current atmosphere of the Department of Corrections with our new leadership. Namely, our director, Samantha J. Brennan, who has been in charge since January 4, 2019, and has created a very hostile environment within our facility, as well as the appointed deputy director, Joe Carbolito. Since January 4, 2019, the leadership then was director Samantha Brennan and deputy director Joey Tulahi. And to note, we did try to reach out to uh, Mr. Tulahi and asked if he'd like to be present. And of course, um, 
we weren't able to get through. So he, I don't think he will show today to give his testimony that he shared concerns with the previous um, information given at the last oversight hearing. Within two weeks, the leadership began to feud amongst themselves that the director was on duty, the deputy director was not on duty. The director would give orders and the deputy director would not follow through. In the eyes of the subordinates, seeing the top leaders not getting along affected the professionalism and productivity of the daily operations, forcing the subordinates to follow suit and act the same way. Our department ranking structure is as follows. Deputy director, correction, director, deputy director, warden, two majors, two lieutenants, which are referred to as the command staff, and of course, us, the subordinate correctioner, correction officers one, two, and three. The reasons behind this hostility is Director Brennan has erected a wall and has forced the personnel to choose sides, her side or the warden's side. It is very unclear that she has no trust to any of the employees of this department other than a certain few which are advising her. She has empowered the Administrative Service <clears throat> Services Officer, ASO Ms. Ovita Nauta, to make decisions in her absence. Ms. Nausa recently pled guilty to a case while she was employed to the Guam Police Department pertaining to the mishandling of funds. Ms. Nausa is again handling departmental funds and budget. Any and all supervisors on duty must report to Ms. Nausa prior to leaving the facility in the absence of director or deputy director. Ms. Nausa is the mully of Director Brennan. Director Brennan has completely removed all decision making from the warden who is the highest ranking officer of this department to include all command staff. We as employees attempt to seek assistance from the command staff, but they must seek approval from the director prior to any decision making. We, the overwhelming subordinates of this department, seek guidance and assistance from our higher ranking officers, the warden, majors, lieutenants, etc. We are forced to seek approval from the director for anything we need in this department such as days off, work orders, maintenance, repairs, etc. The warden is not able to change personnel around from different shifts to meet their personal issues or operational demands, nor is he allowed to change anyone's days off, which is very clear on the duty roster's cover memo stating no changes will be made without the approval of the director's office. This is very unfortunate because the warden is where well aware of everyone's need, the needs. The warden is the person that controls this facility, being a seasoned veteran of 34 years in the field of correction and has earned the respect of the officers as well as the inmates. To prove that the escapees reached out to him to be apprehended in fear of being shot at by the SWAT team of the Guam Police Department. This is very common and has happened in the past, escapees reaching out to us. Officers have been placed on administrative leave pending investigations without being served any notice of investigation and placed back on duty without being served any letter of clearances, which is the policies and procedures of any administrative investigation. Director Brennan has, has implemented numerous changes to satisfy the legislature. However, it is causing more harm than improvement. Officers are working 24 hour shifts, 24 hour plus shifts most of the time. Director Brennan's main concern is controlling overtime. Therefore, in doing so, she has caused a already short-staffed department to operate as a skeleton crew, leaving one officer per, per post with more than 50 inmates in that housing unit. And by doing so, the officers assigned to the housing unit is forced to fend for themselves and do things just to survive. Retention rate of the officers is in this department is at an all-time low. Currently, a total of 39 officers have resigned, retired, or have transferred to other agencies since the Director Brennan took over. The leadership has brought in people from the National Guard to tour the facility for any improvements, as well as to be able to respond to any situation should that situation arise within the facility. By the time the National Guard arrives, someone will be killed or seriously hurt. The current leadership has focused mainly on their own desires and not the needs of the department, meaning we will do as they say. The environment of the Department of Corrections is already a hostile environment dealing with prisoners on a daily basis, as well as the shortage of personnel with the uncertainty of not being relieved. 
Leadership has expressed the implication of the warden's negligence by endangering the officers by picking the escapees up. Leadership does not consider the fact that one officer on duty with more than 50 inmates exceeding 18 hours shift is more of a danger than picking up escapees willing to surrender to seasoned officers to include the warden himself. Currently, the department is on a four day on three day off 12 hours work schedule. Command staff has requested over and over again that we need to be placed on a five day on two day off schedule so that more officers will be on duty to meet the daily operational demands. Again, the, direct, the director's concern is reduction of overtime. On the day of the escape, the director ordered the command staff to come up with a new schedule, which is five days on and two days off. The schedule was submitted and the newly appointed deputy director requested for justification. It is apparent that there is no communication with the director and the deputy director once again leaving us subordinates baffled and confused as to what we should or can do next. Director Brennan has gone on a training trip and diverted to Las Vegas to attend a softball tournament. Director Brennan has placed officers on administrative leave without serving a notice of investigation, which is the procedure in any administrative case concerning violation of the rules and regulations. Director Brennan does not allow the officers of the department to act in their capacity based on rank or, and or positions. Director Brennan has caused the department to fall apart and treat the employees, employees as if they are not competent to do their jobs. Director Brennan lacks trust in us. It is evident that her management has caused major incidents in this department. Three officers on three different, different occasions were assaulted. Two inmates escaped from the halfway house with only one officer on duty at that time, all within a four month span. Director Brennan's main concern is reduction of overtime to satisfy the front office, meanwhile endangering us, the frontline officers. Brennan blames the warden for these incidents. However, it, it is clear on documentation that nothing will be changed on the duty roster without her approval. Director Brennan is trying to implement ways of operations as it as it is done at the Superior Court of Guam. This is the Department of Corrections. We are dealing with prisoners in their houses, so to speak, not probationers or defendants that are trying to prove that they are capable of surviving out in the public. We are dealing with prisoners who will be living here for the rest of their lives. This letter we are submitting will hopefully bring light to the current situation of the department. Officers who have been doing supervisory duties have been revoked from their positions which were detailed since the previous administration. Director Brennan refuses to compensate them, stating that it is not her ability or her responsibility. We have gotten information of, the, of a climate survey that, ha that was to be conducted. However, the warden was the only one interviewed. Numerous subordinates attempted to contact the individuals who conducted the climate survey to express our concerns at a subordinate level to no avail. What is alarming to us all is that Senator Nelson toured the halfway house because of the recent escapes and the Haganya Detention Facility Hub to address the erroneous releases that took place. Senator Nelson was not permitted to enter the briefing room during the shift change to see that only seven officers reported for duty for that particular shift. Okay. Director Brennan is painting a picture to the legislature as if the department is running fine. The following day, Senator Nelson introduces a bill to make the warden position an unclassified position to be appointed by the Director of Corrections and confirmed by the legislature. We, the subordinates, find that to be a very big mistake. In order for someone to be a warden, he must have first had experience working on the front line and gain the respect from staff members and most especially inmates. Having an appointed warden will be detrimental to the department, may cause an uprising within the facility. We pray each and every day that none of our brothers and sisters in green will get killed or, sh or seriously injured. Again, already three officers were assaulted on three different occasions. Senator Nelson again attacked the warden, stating he has too much power because he is able to promote and demote inmates to be housed in the halfway house. Mind you, the warden is the prisoner security administrator. That has been the policy for years. Senator Nelson expressed that she is confident that Director Brennan will fix these issues. It is very clear that Senator Nelson is giving full support to Director Brennan, who has been here for 11 months, and not listening to those who have been in the department for 20 plus years. 
Already six more officers have expressed their desire to seek employment elsewhere. We have exhausted all means of attempts to correct these issues we are dealing with on a daily basis. Our clinical psychologist has spoken to a few of us and advised us on how to cope with this environment created by Director, Director Brennan. Every decision Director Brennan has made thus far has been contrary to good leadership, contrary to security and safety, contrary to good morale, contrary to employee unity, and most, import, most importantly, contrary to logic. Her actions are a direct reflection of her... We are supporting this letter in confidentiality due to fear and retaliation of Di Director Brennan. We are begging you to... We are begging of you to please address this issue and allow us to do our jobs as we have been doing for all these years. We have driven this vehicle for so long, we may have hit potholes, but we never crashed the vehicle. Being seasoned and new officers that work on the front line on a daily basis, we are bracing ourselves for something really tragic to happen. Having one officer on duty with 50 plus inmates could result in catastrophic events at any given time. All we can do at this point is pray that no officer inmate gets killed or seriously injured because of the way this director is running these, this already crippled department. Sincerely, the employees of the Department of Corrections, again, we are refusing to sign and put our names out because we fear retaliation and repercussion from our leadership should we expose ourselves. Sincerely, from the core of the Department of Corrections. Director Brennan, do you have anything to say in response to this letter? No, ma'am. No. I'm just going to ask you some questions in reference to this letter. Is it true that you have had shifts of personnel doing 18 to 24 hours at a time? Yes, ma'am, that has happened. What is the reason for that? Um, the reason for that is um, from one shift to the next, officers don't come in, so there's a shortage of manpower to begin with, and then officers call in sick, or we just can't enough, get enough officers to come in on their day, day off to work. There is a recommendation in this letter that if you move the schedule, which is five days on and two days off, would, you, would this be able to fix the issue? I'm not sure we'll be able to fix the issue, ma'am, but the five and two schedule has been um, uh, suggested from our command staff, and we've asked them to prepare the documents um, to move forward, to give us a roster with a five and two, and so that we were able to implement it. And we received one about two weeks ago, okay. and it was incomplete. And so we, we needed the command staff to also uh, follow through. Um, Major Argan was on leave last week, and so he came in this week, and so we're trying to um, complete that, and hopefully tomorrow or by Friday we'll get that out. So tomorrow you're going to change the, sh the shift change? It'll just go five and two, ma'am. So two. instead of three days off, they'll have two days off. Okay. I want, I want you to know that... Um, I am more concerned with the safety of the officers than saving money on overtime. Absolutely, ma'am. Um, so is this an issue that you're trying to save money on overtime to cut down and it affects the personnel? Is this a purpose to save money on overtime, thereby affecting the operational needs of the, the agency? So initially when we came in, they were on five and two and we noticed that the overtime was high. So yes, initially that was one of the reasons. Then we went to four and three and it was working, but it wasn't working because it always depends on the daily. People may call in sick. So it, we may have 10 people off that day, but then we have other people who may call in sick, have family issues, and so off. They're on annual leave. And so it, the numbers started to dwindle. And so then we were asked to go to five and two and I had disbanded the sort team and our uh, internal affairs so that we could use those individuals to go on the platoon so that we could add more to uh, the um, officers that we had. 
So I was asked, I was continuously asked to go to five and two, as well as to activate the sort team, which didn't make sense to me. How can we go five and two and activate uh, 11 people? It would still leave us at a deficit of officers. And so we continuously asked, please come up with a plan and how it was going to work. And over a period of time, we, I did not get a plan. It was only approximately two weeks ago that I got the plan for a five and two. Why did you disband the SORT team in internal affairs? Because it's manpower shortage, ma'am. To include internal affairs? As well. They were both disbanded for, because of manpower shortages. What was the purpose of, well, this letter states that, um, is the warden still on leave? Yes, ma'am. Has there been um, inmates, issues with inmates? Let's talk about the halfway house. What is the criteria for the halfway house? Um, if I may, I do have um, our casework, Ms. Donna Cruz, okay. who's the authority on that, and okay. I brought her here, and she can speak to that when you can talk about the processes. And Thank you. Ms. Cruz? Oh, there's my papa. Ms. Cruz, if, if I'm, uh, can you please state your name for the record and your position, please? Hello? Okay. Hi. Yes. My name is Donna Cruz. I'm uh, currently the uh, Adjustment and Classification Committee Chairperson, uh, also known as ACC for the Department of Corrections. My committee is comprised of myself, three members, and three alternate members. We are appointed by the Director of Corrections. The Adjustment and Classification Committee utilizes the Executive Order 9705 which was promulgated February 22, 1997 to meet the goals of the Department of Corrections towards rehabilitation and reintegration regarding custody classification for inmates. We also use the General Order 97006 as a guideline and a tool, effective March 29, 1996. The Adjustment Classification Committee convenes to address, <coughs> review, and decide on the custody and program needs of the inmates. We review the inmates' progress and determine which classification is best suited within the institution. The committee sometimes makes referrals and necessary assessments, psychological, medical, and casework in the best interest of the department, the inmate, and the community. When ACC conducts a review, it does not necessarily imply a change in the inmates' custody programming or work assignment. Rather, it serves as a way to monitor the inmates' progress and bring attention to problems that may arise. ACC makes appropriate recommendations concerning basic program changes such as special department treatment-oriented programs assignment, assignment and coordination to the department work assignment, vocational and academic pro program assignment, and we also may reclassify an inmate for cause for adjustment purposes such as a, a disciplinary hearing board where there are negative incidences or they commit a new crime. An inmate's upgrading classification is based on progress, treatment programs, work assignments, education and religious activities, behavior and adjustments, as well as time frame guidelines as we use as a tool. What is the selection criteria for what is the name of this committee? The Adjustment and Classification Committee. The Adjustment and Classification? Yes. What is the criteria um, mm -hmm. if I'm an inmate to, to get into the halfway house? I'm sorry? What is the criteria that if I'm an inmate, I would like to move to the halfway house? What, do, what, what, what are the basic requirements do I need to have in order to avail to the halfway house? Okay. Um, the basic requirements. Basic, the basic requirements to get to the halfway house. Well, uh, let me start off first as uh, how an inmate comes in and how we basically go through the down, down the line as, as they go through the 
to the halfway house. Um, when um, an inmate is adjudicated um, and we receive a judgment, uh, they're basically considered an inmate and we basically have 30 days to review this inmate, to investigate, to review this inmate for um, his classification. There are 11 classifications. The first one to include the unclassified. Uh, the unclassified. Ms. Yeah. Cruz, I'm, I'm confused. Can you just answer my question? Okay. What is the criteria? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Guidelines are time frame. What is the time frame? The time frame, um, it, 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 it varies from different uh, prisoners. Okay, why? Uh, but uh, the best attribute to, to get to the halfway house would be uh, the closest uh, to their parole eligibility, which is at least a two to three years to their parole eligibility or their full-time release. So you must have two to three years of parole eligibility? Yes. And what else? Uh, we also look at their, their discipline, uh, their disciplinary, have they had any disciplinary incidences? We also... Uh, disciplinary really, incidences. Yes. And if they have disciplinary incidences, do you allow them in the halfway house? No. If they're one year or more, no. Okay. We also... Um, there's, if what? there's... Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, we also... Um, we also view them um, on view treatment programs, how much treatment programs have they taken. Um, uh, we also uh, review their stability factors um, and basically uh, their eligibility towards uh, uh, getting down to the halfway house. At the halfway house, there's three different programs that, we, that are there. There's the work credit program for every, uh, 40, every 40 hours, one day knocked off the inmate sentence. And there's the work release program where the inmate gets to go and get a job and, and um, basically gets paid. 45% goes to an inmate compensation fund. The other 45% goes to court fines and restitution. And the other 10% goes to an in, uh, inmate's savings account or is designated to uh, a family member. So has, has there been any inmates that have been that have resided in the halfway house that exceeded the three-year eligibility of parole? Yes. Yes. Are, do you allow felons in the halfway house? Yes. Do you allow inmates that have created? Um, that have created violence, domestic violence, or any kind of sexual assault in the halfway house? Third degree, yes. Only third degree? Has yes. there been any instance where there's been less than a third degree and you've put this inmate in a halfway house? Less than third degree? You mean fourth degree? I mean first, second? No. There... How long have you been working there, Ms. Cruz? 22 years. 22 years. Is Director Brennan, if you have more than, um, a, if you put in individuals who have more than three years of parole el eligibility to live at a halfway house, essentially, it's like um, it's a camp. It's it's no longer prison. They're no longer serving t serving time if they're there for more than, if say for perhaps the person's there for ten years get sentenced to DOC for 10 years, and then they go into the halfway house. Mm -hmm. They have nine years of parole eligibility before they're able to go to parole. You put them in the halfway house. Do you, do you think that that's a disservice to the community? I think based on the criteria that is set up, that we should follow it. So my opinion, um, yes, ma'am. Did you, are you looking at this uh, criteria to change it? Um, not necessarily to change it, ma'am, but we're looking at the criteria and we're having everybody reevaluate it that's currently at post nine.
If I may interject, um, um, yes, Vice Speaker. Please. Also, t time frame requirements. And, and as I said, every prisoner is different. Um, to get into the halfway house for first time offenders, 40%, they need to serve 40% between unclassified through the medium classification. As soon as they hit into the 60%, that's when they become eligible for m the minimum classification. And based on their their um, institutional behavior, their treatment, um, and uh, stability factors, and, and so forth, um, they do make it to the halfway house, or, or the ACC do, does recommend um, down to minimum amount status, whether it be work credit, educational release, or work release. Ms. Cruz? Ms. Cruz, is the, you said there was a committee, an adjustment and classification committee? Yes. Three members appointed by the director. Yes. Is the warden a member? No, the warden is the uh, final authority, uh, appointing authority. Oh, um, so you make a recommendation yes. to him? The committee, yes, does make a recommendation. And he makes the final decision? Yes, he makes okay. the final decision. Okay. Thank you. Um, Vice Speaker, if I may, um, I do remember that there is uh, one individual that is um, down there for uh, a degree for more than, uh, more than third degree CSC. And that is correct. There's one. There's one inmate, yes. How did that inmate get approved into the halfway house? Um, that individual um, was prior uh, to my, my uh, um, reign uh, in, into the, as a chair, um, but he did, per law, he did do the, um, the uh, time frame. He had, he, he com he completed the time frame for his criminal sexual conduct, and now he's doing the other time, uh, the other times for for his for his sentence. He's completed the CSC offense. He's completed 25 years. And what had happened was um, the prior committee basically had um, recommended and. Uh, the PSA overrode it and placed him in the minimum out classification. What did but the, per law, what he, did the prior committee uh, re uh, recommend for that individual? Yes, uh, to continue at the minimum in classification in the prison. Yes, that's at post twenty four. Post twenty four. That's within the perimeter. They're not allowed to go outside. Okay, and who, what is a PSA? The Prison Security Administrator. And who was that at that time? Uh, who, who was that at that time? Warden Allen Bora. Say again? Warden Allen Bora. Oh, thank you. Senator Tello. Thank you, very, thank you Madam Chair. Um, I have a question with regards to internal affairs. Uh, Director Brennan, you know, and I'm it's quite alarming, you know, especially something like this, internal affairs, considering what's been going on in the media in the last three months for you not to, ha so you're saying that internal affairs is no longer in ex existence because of the manpower? And initially, because of our manpower shortage, I uh, made a decision to disband both our sort team and our IA. However, uh, I believe it was two months ago that I reactivated IA because we had um, cases that came before us and I needed that to reinstitute that section, ma'am. Okay, I appreciate it. And how many have you assigned to Eternal Affairs? I have two. two. I currently have two. Do you think that's sufficient? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, you need to ask up front you know, the administration for additional help on that, I think. If you could please make that uh, request to the administration. Second one I had is, um, you know, the letter that I, that uh, there are, 
chairperson had, had read off. It, it was reading off of a letterhead. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been in government agencies before, and the only one who has authority to use these letterheads have to have it cleared by the director or those in charge. So would you consider this letter, I mean, it, it's on a government letterhead by an anonymous person. Are you, you know, with the... Are you trying to find out who these people are? Because they're using a letterhead that has to be approved by, or maybe it doesn't. Maybe you can ask that question for me. Do you, does anybody in the agencies who's using the Department of Corrections letterhead have to have approval by the director's office to use that? Yes, ma'am. Anybody using our official letterhead must come to our office where we give them a, a document number and we note it down where that document is going to. So you must get approval to use our, per, our letterhead within DOC. So that is quite alarming and concerning to me as well. So I'm sure you're gonna look into that because the use of a letterhead is, is uh, something that needs to be looked into. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Director Brennan, can you explain the purpose of the fence that you're building at the halfway house? Can I explain the fence that I'm Maybe. building around Post 9 or Halfway House? Yes. I'm putting up a fence around Post 9 Halfway House, ma'am, to ensure more? the safety and security of our community and, the, and public safety. What is the purpose of the Halfway House? What is the purpose of the Halfway House? It's, the Halfway House is, on our Post 9, is also the, um, the area where these, uh, they're placed through our ACC board to give them a minimum in, minimum out, minimum, minimum out to allow them to have some flexibility where they're able to, re to be eligible for work credit, um, work release, and then education release, which allows them to reintegrate back into our community so that at the time they're, they're getting ready to be released, then it's an easy transition for them. Is it supposed to be intended that you have a fence up at the halfway house? Beg your pardon? Is it supposed to be intended that you have a fence up at the halfway house? What is this? It's a psychological profiling, right? You're preparing them to be out in the community. You've put a fence up. Well, usually, ma'am, the halfway house is not located on the compound like it, like it is situated currently. So the halfway house, ideally, if a halfway house was located um, five miles from the Department of Correction or somewhere else uh, away from us, then ideally, no, we wouldn't have to have a fence. At this point, I've chosen, because it is part of our compound, to put the fence up to ensure the community safety and the public safety as well. So I've made that decision. Are you worried that there might um, be some kind of, um, in this letter that we received, they keep on talking about someone getting injured, seriously injured or killed. Are you worried that there might be at any instance the riots in the, in the compound? That's a concern every day. Are you trying to address that issue? Yes, ma'am. We're working on recruitment right now. And uh, as we speak, we have um, two that for reemployment that we hope to move forward with GOA, working with them this week. Hopefully, they'll come on board soon, next week. And they'll be going through some refresher. So that's only two. And then we also selected 19 that are currently going through. Um, the, out of the 19, 13 have, are, have completed the background investigation and are currently with uh, GPD for the polygraph, and then once we get the, that second part of it, then they'll come back and then we'll perform the psych eval, and then they have to go to a class, a distant class, and then uh, finally we can hope to have them do the final urinalysis and then come on board. Once they do come on board, however, they have to go to GCC and attend um, uh, the academy um, and their apprenticeship as well at GCC, working with Department of Labor. So that could be um, up to four months before they will become, be able to come online and do OJT. What is the purpose for the 31 officer attrition in the Department of Corrections? What are some of the reasons for that attrition? Did they just resign from the position or did they leave because of retirement? Did they leave to transfer to other areas of the law enforcement agency? Um, all of the above, ma'am. Uh, when I came on board, we have individuals that, we had three that moved to Customs. They were vetted and got picked up at Customs, so they, they did move there. We had individuals that uh, retired. We also had individuals that um, just quit and, and moved on, moved off island, or they moved to uh, other agencies within the government. We had a few um, 
lateral transfers as well. Senator Tello has a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Director, there's a section here that says officers have been placed on administrative leave pending investigations without being served a notice of investigation and placed back on duty without being served any letter of clearance, clearances, which, which is the policies and procedures of any administrative investigation. Have you, um, has this ever happened, a practice that you've, you've done while you've been a director when there's been an uh, administrative leave pending an investigation without a notice being served? Um, Ma'am, at this point, I can't speak to um, that, those statements. There is an ongoing investigation uh, from, the, from the incident that happened on October 9th, and it is being investigated by the Guam Police Department. So anything regarding any of that information, I'm not unable to speak to, about. But this is a simple question. Uh, when an officer is placed on administrative leave pending an investigation, you ha I'm not asking who that officer is or anything like that. I'm just asking. When that happens, do you provide that officer a notice why they are on administrative leave is my question. And if that ever happened, did you never provide any kind of notice? So ma'am, um, after GPD took over the investigation, then we did have some individuals that I placed on administrative leave. They were provided the proper documents. Okay, that's the question I'm looking for. Yes ma'am. Uh, so the whole time you're in, okay. You swear, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I swear too. Okay, thank you so much. Because I've seen the documents. Okay, appreciate that. Okay, thank you so much. What measures have you in implemented to ensure the safety of the officers throughout their work day at DOC due to this um, shortage? Some of them are working 18 to 24 hour shifts. What measures have you implemented to ensure their safety? I don't quite understand. What measures have I implemented to ensure the safety of our officers? Yes, um, when they're working 18 hours or 24 hours because of, for whatever reason, you're not able to have enough personnel at the prison because they're calling in sick. So you, now these officers are being burnt out. They're getting overwhelmed. They're exhausted, and when you're exhausted and in this, in this kind of environment, you become very vulnerable. You start to lose, um, you know, the, the sense of, you know, awareness. And so what safety measures have you implemented to counter the impacts of you having to require the officers to stay there that long? Well, ma'am, a few months ago, we put in a, an... Uh, um a policy that stated that our officers were only allowed to work a certain amount of overtime every in, within a two-week period. That was 34 hours. However, thereafter, so that was one of the safety reasons to ensure that nobody would be working the 24 hours. Um, over time, because of the shortage of manpower and then the, um, the loss of more officers and stuff, that number creeped up where instead of 34 every two weeks, it creeped up, it became 50. Um, sometimes it became 60. Uh, working with my command staff, having our uh, weekly meetings, um, I was always asking them, please ensure that they're not working that, uh, try and do the rotation so that it's not the same officer that comes in all the time. Try and reach out to the other officers who are not, uh, not wanting to work on that one day off, as on the three days off. So we've tried to reach out to the people who are on um, regular days off to come in. And sometimes we call them and they come in, sometimes they don't. So I, we've put that into place. Um, other things I've done is uh, we uh, recertified individuals with pepper spray so that um, they're able to have a tool in the event that something that would happen. But mainly it's just working of our command staff and our platoon commanders to ensure that they get the proper personnel to come in on a daily, on each shift, and, uh, and then working with uh, GOA to move the recruitment um, forward as quick as possible so that we can get our officers hired. So you stated it seems like that you have an issue with the officers wanting to come to work, and usually that's contributed to um, a low morale. 
have you met with your with the correction officers and um, ask them about their concerns, um, their needs. Instead of relying on your command staff, have you gone down to the trenches and asked them what can you do to serve them better as a director? Yes, absolutely. I've met with uh, platoons on more than one occasion. I've gone in at, mid at um, excuse me, when we were at 5.30 in the morning to five, I've gone in early morning, I've gone in, um, in the evening, I've gone both times. I've, I have um, met with them directly. I've asked their command staff to step out the, of the room while I, I address them, and some of them have come forward and told me some of their issues. So I've done my best to try and address that. Um, uh, in all honesty, there are some officers who refuse to speak to me because of fear of retaliation. So that has also happened. So I've done my best to go and speak to them. I've even, I've even they all have my cell phone number. They, they're free to call me. I've had that open door. They can come and see me. And usually we just, because of it's paramilitary, we ask them to go through the chain of command. However, if there's any fear of retaliation, I've also told them, come and see me. So I do have an open door policy and stuff, but I would prefer that they go through the chain of command. However, of course, if there's any fear that um, they're able to reach out to me, and many have reached out to me, ma'am. Uh, out, of, out of the personnel in this room here, who here is in your command staff? Major Uggen, Captain Lazama, Major Kitawa. Three of them. I would like them to come to the table, please. Sure. Command staff, Major Ruggin, Major Kitagua. She's not on my command. Major. Ma'am, come forward. We're going to take a quick five minute recess.
We are back from recess. Um, we have the command staff and also Mr. Mike Kinata, who is the chief parole officer. And I'd like to ask you some questions about the halfway house. Um, can you just state your name for the record, please, Mr. Kinata? My name is Michael Polito Kinata, Chief Parole Officer. And your, your, um, and what is your position? Chief Parole Officer. Chief Parole Officer. Sorry, we heard screaming outside in the foyer, so got a little distracted. Perhaps someone can check that, Mr. the Sergeant at Arms. Um, Mr. Kinata, can you tell me the criteria for the halfway house? Uh, basically, what uh, Ms. Donna Cruz mentioned, the criteria to get there. Um, I used to run the halfway house when I was house at TGen. Uh, so the, they're vetted, whoever goes there is vetted by the Adjustment and Classification Committee. And when, when I did run the halfway house, it was an agreement between the warden, the social work supervisor, administrator, and myself that anybody coming out to the halfway house has to qualify for all three programs. Work credit, work release, or education release. You cannot come there because you qualify for one of those programs that's, that's being done out there. Has there been at any time inmates in the halfway house that did not qualify for all three? When I took over the halfway house, there are inmates there that did not qualify for all three. And uh, how we were able to fix that, if you violated, it, you knew you were, you were doomed and you went back and never had the opportunity to come out. And I believe there's still some inmates that are in that category that have not, you know, they've done real well. They follow the rules so that they don't get sent to disciplinary hearing board and they get sent back to the, and will never come back out to the. I guess they had an issue with expo facto. They were sentenced before the law changed. Is there anyone that didn't, that after the law changed, they still would put them at the halfway house even if they didn't qualify for all three? Y yes, there's, there's some that are still there. I don't know the amount. And, you know, they've, they've been model, what we would say model inmates, uh, been complying with the rules. What are the hours that the inmates, or that the inmates that reside in the halfway house, what are the hours that they're able to come in and out of the house? Um, at night, they're, they're, because of the minimum security they're, they're at, it's not as stringent as the headcounts that would come like every hour, every third of it, however, whatever, you know, class, it depends on the classification. The halfway house at Tizan, we're away from the facility, we're not fenced in, the officers will do their count. Of course, we had the, the proper manning at that time um, when I was out at Tizan. So what is the, so you're saying that the inmates can travel in and out of the halfway house at any given time, they're not restricted? Basically in and out of their housing area, the, the buildings they're in, but to leave the facility once they're in, at a certain time, they, they cannot travel out. Unless they're working like midnight, and that's pre-approved by the director to, to allow to go to work release or those kind of things. Yeah. There has been work programs that required inmates to work at midnight? Of course. I don't think it's that, that's the case right now, but it's happened in the past. Um, the halfway house used to be, uh, just a little historical so you understand, the halfway house used to be up in uh, NCS, and that was a, a crazy kind of setup. So when I started working, they were all brought back in because they were like running, running about the inmates up there. So they were brought into the main facility, which really they don't belong there because it's a community-based corrections. Now the challenge is for correction to find a place that's going to be suitable to house these guys. And you know, your basic NIMBY, not in my backyard kind of um, mentality with the community, which, which is understood. So from there, they move into the main facility. Then we're able to finally find them a place out to Tijan. But because of some personalities and you know, the politics involved, they were removed from Tijan and sent back in. I think the excuse then. Uh, I know Senator Defunto, Senator Ben asked, and the, the reasoning they gave him was, it's too much noise from the airplane. But we were there for like three years. So noise was not an issue. So, you know, those kind of things you understand.
place a role in a lot of the things we do. So now they're back up at the main facility. Thank you, Mr. Kinatsa. I want to thank the command staff for coming up here. Um, the director stated that she has gone out to the correction officers one, two, and three, asked them if there are any issues, uh, any situations, any concerns that they'd like to address within the department. And she's done her best to address those issues. Now you work directly with the correction officers one, two, and three. Most of the time you're, the, the, you're part of their, you're the supervisor command. And so I wanted to know uh, your views on um, the impacts and changes that have been implemented to the safety of the correction officers and what you've heard from them, their concerns, and have those issues been brought to the director? And if so, have they been fixed or addressed? Um, maybe we can start with Major Q. Thank you. Ma'am, I think the director is addressing the, the issues and concerns of the officers. Um, we've been asking for the five and two roster. The director has spoken to the officers without the command staff being there. I'm not sure what the issues are specifically because she's on, you know, with them, with the officers. But the five and two roster has been an issue for the past two, three weeks. Um, ever since before the director left for her uh, training. And there has still been no uh, resolution on the roster. Um, but we've been asking for the five and two. Um, at first, it was um, to provide justification for the reason on going five and two. And uh, when she left, zero two took over. And um, we addressed the issue again about the five and two roster. And we were told that um, there will be no changes until the director returned. So we just kind of waited until she returned. And we, it's being addressed again. And um, thus far, no, no resolution or, or no decision has been made on the five and two roster. So um, the five and two will provide more officers for the shift, but it doesn't take away again, ma'am, the, you know, calling in sick. If we add, if we take the five and two roster, you're getting maybe <clears throat> 10 or 12 individuals for the roster for that particular shift. But at the rate of calling out sick, unpredicted um, leave, emergencies, things of that nature, we're almost like where we, you know, we started at. I mean, there was no, no really um, resolution to the problem because we are very short. And that's always been the problem. We're short of personnel, period. Across the board, we're short of personnel. The 12-hour roster we've been on, we've been in for like three, four years already. Officers are burning out, they're getting sick, and that's why the always calling in sick. We have officers that have never had problems coming to work, developing sick problems, because they're tired, they're burned out. We need more officers, and I think the director's um, on target when she's trying to push the hiring process, even trying to shorten it, because we do need the officers. And she's been harping on that since she's uh, come on board. The other things about the five and two roster is that it doesn't change the mission of the department. We're supposed to have more officers to do the job, but we still end up having one officers in the unit with 50 plus personnel. That doesn't change. When we have an incident and individuals have to report, how do you report or respond to an incident when you only have enough officers to post in the unit? We have 14 units that needs manning at any given time. 
sometimes even more because we have GMH or mental health. So we oftentimes have to have, even the duty officer has to pull a post or a unit. And we shouldn't go there because the duty officer has to be available and access to the whole operations of the shift. She cannot be posted because if she or he is posted, he cannot leave the unit. It will be left on man. And normally you have more than 20 prisoners in a unit who is going to supervise them. So that's a risk that the duty officers take to fill in the shortage of personnel. So even with the five and two, we're still gonna run risks of units being short, lack of officers to respond to incidences. What is the current personnel shortage now? We are operating at 160 officers, I believe, 100 currently. 100 well, we used to have 230. 160 or 160 106? major organ, I think, has the exact number, ma'am. What is it? 160 officers. Okay, 160, 160 officers. Director, have you, sp have you spoken to the governor about this, this significant shortage of officers and how it impacts their safety significantly? Yes, ma'am. And what, what is being done to address this? I'm working with DOA. Uh, I came on board on January 8th, I believe, and uh, it was an, the announcement for a correction officer was um, published, and it was a continuous announcement. So from January of this year, I did not receive the eligibility list to do interviews until September. Okay. So once I got it in September, I immediately did the interview. So yes, we um, I have been working with uh, the governor, the, the lieutenant governor with, with DOA to do, our, to do everybody's best so that we can move it forward. Okay, we have also an additional appropriation bill for DOC so that you can recruit and in our discussions to allocate money for the promotion ranks. Yes, ma'am. Have you worked that out with DOA yes, to um, ensure that once that bill is, uh, hopefully the governor will sign that bill into law, that money is appropriated, that you will be able to use this expeditiously? Um, yes, ma'am, and I, we appreciate that um, out of the 400000 in the event we did the numbers in the event that we do get that appropriation, that it would, uh, for one officer, one year, it's like $42,000. So that would be cl close to nine, ten officers. Mm -hmm. And then for our promotions, uh, it's upward of seventy grand in order to do promotions the way that I would like to promotions to, to bring our command staff to be in a better place as well as our officers to elevate them to be officer, uh, correction officer two. And then we have the influx of uh, recruits coming in as officer ones. Do you need more money for promotions and for recruitment then? Um, of course, ma'am. Uh, more money so that we can continuously recruit. Uh, as Major Kitagot stated, we're at 160, we're at 230, and our numbers are, 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 are dwindling. And, I, and so we would always, it would just be great if we could continue to um, have more officers, uh, have uh, an eligib eligibility list, uh, there, so in the event that we have to do any kind of recruitment, that it'd be there and we didn't have to wait so long. So it takes, you, you mentioned earlier, it takes four months to get these officers on duty, right? The training, the, all the requirements. And so if we, even if we appropriate this fiscal year, you have how many recruits in the pipeline right now? Uh, we have, how many that we're actually, um, 19? You have 19 recruits and then 19. you are ready to hire an additional three, was that it? So we have 19 recruits, that are not, not recruits yet, but eligible elig candidates that we're hoping to come on board after they pass all their uh, requirements. We have two for reemployment. So we're, we're actually doing interviews tomorrow morning to get a few more out of the current list that we have from GOA. GOA has another eligibility list that they will give it to us, and I believe there's upwards of 24 on that list that we want to look at and get an additional 10 so that we can uh, bring our numbers up to 35 in terms of uh, this current fiscal year uh, in terms of uh, FTEs. Okay, Thereafter, so should we get additional funding, then yes, ma'am, that will just require us again, and we can move forward faster because we do have the current list. 
So you're telling me you have sufficient amount of money to hire the 19 recruits that on the first eligibility list that are candidates, 24 recruits on the second eligibility list that was provided to you by DOA, and an additional 10 more recruits? No, ma'am. I'm saying out of the list that DOA has, it's like 24 that are eligible, and we want to get additional 10 an additional from that 10. list in order to fund it to get our 35 that we have vacancies at this time. Okay, so that's 34. About 34, 35. 35. My numbers may be off, but yes, ma'am. How long will it take you to get that additional uh, th 34? You have that the eligibility, the second eligibility list, list with 24, and then you want to hire another 10. How long will that take you? We're doing interviews tomorrow to vet um, as many as we can, and then I hope to have um, another interview within the next two weeks to to meet that 35 that number 35 th uh, threshold, and. So if we do the interviews and then we go through the process again, uh, mind you, we do the interviews, we do the selection, then it's to have to go to the background investigation. So that's going to take time. Is there a way that you can, um, is there a way that the criteria for these recruits, perhaps there are some areas that are must do, right? Like background investigation, uh, they do a polygraph. Yes, ma'am. Um, the testing, the drug testing. And the psyche so, valve. And the psyche valve. Is there a way that you can is, uh, shorten the required time length to make that happen so that you can have boots on ground in two months instead of four? I think at this point, because that's the post requirement, that we have to follow that. However, um, there may be, perhaps the legislature can be creative to assist us to move that forward. I would defer to um, this body. Well, I'm deferring it back to you because you, if you don't give me a concrete plan, then I can't do anything about it. Well, ma'am, I do have the list. I do currently have a list. Uh, I was just told today DOA has a list. They're also testing in the next couple of weeks uh, an additional 84. So the, they will be giving me another list. So okay. I, at this point, now I have the list. Okay. Now I have the list and I can do the interviews and we can, we can make some selections. Then we can move it forward. And then if we get additional funding, then I can continue to, to, to also do interviews and bring it forward. It's, but it's still going to require those three processes of going through the background check, the polygraph, and also the psych eval, the urinalysis, and the DISIT class. If I can move that faster, we're working with other agencies to assist us. We work with Customs, who does our background. We work with GPD, who does the polygraph. Fortunately, at GPD, they have two individuals who do the polygraph. One is on military, so we only have one individual that's doing it. So we're Can working. you outsource for the polygraph? Perhaps that's something, yes, ma'am, I would look into and see if we were able to do that and have a contract. Yeah. So we're trying to. Yes, ma'am. I'm, I'm worried. Uh, okay, this, this letter that was written is very concerning. Uh, I don't want, I don't want to see a riot at DOC because of low morale. I don't want to see our officers hurt because we're not able to fill these positions quick enough. I mean, we're, we get you the appropriation. You need more money. I'll, I'll ask my colleagues to get more money. But we need a concrete plan to, to narrow the timeline down. And we need the agencies. We need the help of the administration to narrow the timeline down to put these officers in place at DOC. Yes, ma'am. So I mean, that's, that's my concern. That's, that's my foremost concern, is, is their safety. And that as mine as well. And the well. safety of the inmates. So I, I, I need something. We can't, we, you know, we need something concrete. We, we're discussing it. I put out a bill for $500,000 to help move some appropriation to you. You're saying you need more. How much more do you need to hire the 10 recruits? You so, said the 400000 would only cover about nine. Okay. So we probably need to get that exact number so that I can ask the appropriations chair of the legislature to give you another 400000 so you can fill that 10. But you still have 19 plus 24 to, to put into, into position for boots on ground. Yes, so the issue here is not just the appropriation now for the 10 recruits that you also want. The issue here is how are we going to move them quickly enough and make them meet all the requirements to get them inside the prison you know, to perform these duties. I mean, you have 160 officers, but how many people call off sick, call in sick, or don't come to work out of the 160 officers? So you're, 
severely undermanned. And, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but how do we move this quicker? And if we need to introduce policy to move this quicker, then the legislature is here to help introduce policy to move this quicker. Now, I cannot do the work of the agency non less requested to assist in bringing the agencies together to see what we can do to move this timeline forward, if you want me to do that, and go to the post committee and try to resolve these requirements and see what we can do then move them into a shorter timeline so that they can have boots on ground in, in, the, in the correction center. But I'm a senator. I don't, I don't work at DOC. Ma'am, can I speak? I think there, there's laws regarding hiring and all that. There's a process. And that's why it takes so long. Yes. But I also need to point out that we cannot stop. We, the turnover rate for corrections is the yeah. worst in the law enforcement agency, in any law enforcement agency. So we need to be continuous in that process. That's what I want to bring out. Yeah. We need to be continuous in the hiring process so that we are able to replace the officers that we lose and not wait for a year, two years, three years sometimes for them to be replaced. Mm -hmm. We need to have the priority for hiring to get these officers on board right. as quickly as we lose them. Because, you know, they come on, they come on board and then we lose them to GPD or we lose them to customs, as was mentioned earlier. So our hiring process and interviews and whatnot should be continuous. I think the director hit on that. It has to be continuous. So in that regard, I think it will help us try to recover so you we, know, a lot we, sooner. Right. We need to know the changes or the changes that we have to address in the law to move this timeline quicker. If, if we don't get, am. like uh, Major Rugg and I asked him for the rules and regulations that he sent to the governor's office in 2017, 2018, we discussed, right? And those rules and regulations, the new rules and regulations were never promulgated, so I asked him for a copy. I don't know, I have yet to receive a copy, and we've reached out several times for a copy for the rules and regulations of the, you know, for the prison. If we don't get the information quick enough, then we can't help the community. If you're going to keep everything close hold, then there's nothing, you know, what, what help can we do? Um, absolutely, you need to bring everything into the light so we can fix it. It's the, leadership's, it's the leadership's duty to advocate for these things, to open, you know, look outside the box and find ways to help, help the agency. We're asking for information. We don't receive it from DOC. Everything is close hold. I mean, if there's an investigation saying, I cannot give you the rules and regulations or we cannot address the shortage of personnel because it's an investigation, then say it's an investigation. But it shouldn't be an investigation is my point. We're asking for information to help DOC, but we don't get it half the time. I'm asking you right now, can you come tomorrow? Can we figure out a way to shorten the timeline so that you can have more boots on ground? Do we all have to walk over to DOA and make a, a resolution or a bill to say you need to prioritize DOC? Or can the director do that at the, be, you know, at the behest of the administration? Yes, ma'am, and I have addressed it. I've, I've, we've spoken to the governor. We meet on Wednesdays, and I've spoken to the governor in, in, in our meetings. And I've asked, like, even if we could do an emergency, emergency um, recruitment because of our manpower shortages. So that has been addressed as well. In our last oversight, I also brought up in, in, the, in our oversight hearing, I also brought up the idea of can we just um, I work with individuals who from, coming from GCC who already have a criminal justice uh, certificate and hire them and then through the, through the vetting, hire them and then through the period of time where they're on uh, boots on ground and go to the training and then go through the processes of getting the background investigation, the polygraph and then as well as the psych eval so that we can get them trained and, and move them forward. Um, that, that was one of the suggestions I brought up previously. And again. So what is the concrete impact of it? What is, what is the, with those requests that you've had, what do we see from it? At, at this Did it point, shorten the timeline? Are they implementing it? What is the, what is, 
what is something that I can hold to say that this request has been granted so that DOC receives more officers? Where is, where is the tangible in, it, in this request? So at this point, ma'am, you're absolutely right. I need to work with your office closer and come up with ideas and how to implement this so that you can assist us to change the law. Well, you're, you already told me that you came up with the ideas. Yes, right? ma'am. So I'm asking you, when you did this request to the administration, where is, where's the concrete, where's the tangible impact? It did, is, are, they, are they going to shorten the timeline? Uh, is there an agreement with the post saying that okay, the training will be prioritized and as they're, on, as they're working on duty, then they'll go through the polygraph through this certain timeline. Has there been a phase plan in place? Have you gone to the post? Have you put out a phase plan? Have you, is there anything tangible that shows this work, shows this recommendation? I'm trying to recall, ma'am, if anything tangible other than we, we have gone and we've, we've addressed it. But um, you're absolutely right. We will have to document it and then move it forward because you're absolutely right. It's not tangible. We have worked and we've had asked these questions. We've gone to post to actually change some of the, of the um, rules, which we, we, they actually did in terms of the English and the math uh, um, criteria and the requirements there. So that, that's been put at the end. So at this point, it, it affects all law enforcement. So it's something that we have to do as a collective group. But um, we'll, I would just have to uh, document, put in black and white, and, and sub submit my request, and then hope to get a response either way so that I can move it forward. Director, have you talked to the post committee during their meetings and presented yes, a, a phase plan for them, saying this is what I need? Uh, yes, ma'am. We've gone forward. An official and document. An official document? Yes, no, on not paper showing them this is the plan that DOC needs to hire more officers quickly. No, ma'am, only working with DOA. With DOA and asking them about getting our eligibility list so that we can move it forward. But in submitting anything to the post other than just in the meetings and bring it up um, verbally, no. Because you said four months. Your officers, the morale apparently is low. They don't want to come to work anymore. Four months. Anything can happen tomorrow. We were sitting here in oversight hearing and two inmates run away from the halfway house. And I'm hearing that the only reason per someone knew about it is because an inmate that was being released saw them. So I'm concerned, this four months, anything can happen. You know, I mean, there are things that you can control and there are things that you can't. And you couldn't, could, you, sitting at an oversight hearing, you weren't able to control the fact that two of your inmates left the halfway house. That's, that's something you can't control. But I'm concerned that something's going to happen at DOC and the officers are going to be hurt. Senator Tidegui, uh, do you have a question? Thank, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Um, Sam, I, I'm glad to hear that you, you're not ashamed to go to the governor's office and call for a state of an emergency because I think it's a very appropriate. And if you need it in black and white, I think you just need to send a letter to the front office and let them know that you are in a state of emergency right now. Um, and I think the, the good chair was talking about trying to find a solution, you know, I hate to say this, guys, but women, we can multitask a lot better, and that means finding a solution that would lessen the amount of uh, uh, manpower, like, for instance, a, a facility that is more, um, more conducive instead of spread out, like DOC is, is right now. It's so spread out. That means you have to have one guy way over here and another guy here, and then usually, I mean, I'm talking about the movies where you see it's like a two-story or three-story, but it's all manned in one area with less police officers. This is an option that can run parallel with what you're trying to do, and I'm hoping that you can put that in a, um, an idea like that on how to rebuild the facility so that you don't need so many uh, police officers or uh, uh, Correction officers there. And that leads me to another. So uh, could you look into that, Sam, about how to reconfigure 
a, a correctional facility that, that's not so spread out that makes it easier. And I think you know what I'm talking about. So there's been ideas in the past, I believe. Uh, I think it was uh, former Senator Klitsky who, who had brought up this idea too as well. And, and just building the facility to uh, make it easier to man for the officers. Is there a difference between a detention officer and a, a, a correction officer? Are their qualifications are the same? Or is there a difference between an, a detainee officer versus a correction officer? So um, the detention uh, facility guard or a detention officer was a title that um, from previous years when they were hired and then it evolved to a correction officer. I see. So there's no difference. They still have to follow the same criteria. Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, have you reduced the inmates' activities um, to, to lessen the amount of you know, uh, guards on, on, um, on duty? Because I know that when the inmates have certain activities, you have to make sure there's officers there to, to oversee it. Have you reduced some of the activities uh, based on you know, the shortage or people calling in sick? Well, unfortunately, you guys can't go out here because we don't have enough people, so you lessen the activities. Have you looked into that? I know some from manpower shortages, there's been times when uh, uh, religious services have been canceled. Um, has a major? And Captain Azama, have you canceled uh, rec recreational as well? Visitation has been canceled. It, it, and uh, so there has, been our, there has been times when, yes, ma'am, due to our manpower shortage that um, the platoon commanders have canceled it. Well, I, I greatly appreciate, you know, you, you guys doing everything you can, you know, to try and make it work with your shortage. And, uh, but please run parallel to pro pro providing a solution with less police off uh, correction officers in, in building a facility that's uh, more conducive and, and, and easier to man by less people than, than, uh, than you really need, what you really need right now where it's so spread out. But yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you. Director, I want you to know, I'm sure you're aware that I was the oversight chair for Department of Corrections. Now, I'm not blaming you for these issues, okay? But we need to address the issue now. This issue of um, the post requirements hindering um, the hiring of, of officers was not an issue last term. The issue was they were not able to get um, enough personnel on the list from what the leadership was telling me they were not able to get personnel on the list to do the hiring. And so we, you know, we tried to move DOC with that route and they continue to, uh, there's continue to be, be this natural attrition. So now that we're looking at this, okay, now the issue is how can we move the post requirement, right? So which post requirement um, can we avail to? How do we change the statute? So this is the information that, you know, you've, you talked about, but um, if we can change the statute, if we can write a bill tomorrow to change the statute, make sure we're well within the law and we're not too, um, like a former colleague would say, lackadaisical on the requirements. They still have to meet the, you know, the stringent requirement to make sure that they are morally sound for the job, then let's do that. But we need, we need something concrete, right? And so I'm going to end this oversight hearing and I'm going to ask that we perform these due outs within the next, say, week and a half, two weeks. I, I don't know when the next post meeting is, do you? Uh, it, what is this? I believe it was canceled in October, so the end of the month. It's usually the, I believe, the last week, the last Thursday of the month. The last Thursday of the month, okay. We go to the post, the last Thursday of the month in this meeting in November, their meeting in November which I think is Thanksgiving, so it might be. Okay, uh, so they might have moved it. Correct. Okay, so we'll find out. And we go to the post with the plan to see what requirements we can um, initiate right away and what requirements can we initiate during, the, during their time of work, right? Because you need, you, need you need to get as many officers in there as you can, and this is the four months is not enough for you. I understand your hands are put behind your back in, in this, this, these kind of requirements, but let's move something forward. Let's, let's fight together to get them 
and if we can, to move them to this two months. Yes, ma'am. So we so going to the post and trying to change the post law, which would right. require the legislative right. body we to make move. some decisions, right. then uh, we thank you very much because it will help DOC move forward. Because once we do the interviews and if we're able to streamline some of it, then we're able to get these individuals on board quicker. So I thank you. I thank you so much for um, allowing us to move that forward. And as soon as we get that done, I will uh, hold the public hearing and I will ask the speaker if we can have a special session because this does involve the safety of our community. And so this is an emergency. So this is something that I'm going to commit to to you that I am going to work to see uh, what we can do to change the statute and then also have a special session so we don't wait a month or two months or three months so that if the statute is in place and becomes law for the special session, we can act expeditiously and we can move it forward, okay? Yes, ma'am. And then you are committing also to making the, the, the letter from the anonymous correction officers. You're committing also that um, you're going to change out your shift rotation to five and two starting tomorrow. Is that what that it's is? Effective Sunday. It'll be effective Sunday, ma'am. It'll be effective Sunday. Yes. Are the officers aware that it'll be effective Sunday? Um, we, it was supposed to be effective last Sunday. However, the plan that we got was incomplete. So we're finalizing it tomorrow. Um, uh, G Zero Two and I had this discussion today and we're trying to complete that and then we'll run it through uh, Major Uggen and then we will implement it this weekend. Okay, and then um, the concern about the, the warden bill. I want it on record that I did not discuss the warden bill uh, with, uh, with you. It was something I did on my own cognizance. It is something that is in other jurisdictions that are done. And so this is something that we're looking at because we're also looking for a way um, to find out if we can secure some money in some way or fashion with the help of the administration perhaps to build a new facility, but we don't know how long that's going to take. So we're starting to prepare the organizational structure, um, hoping and anticipating that DOC's issues really uh, become addressed because we cannot continue like this anymore. Um, and I know uh, some of these issues, uh, perhaps the erroneous releases, the, um, the situation of inmates going in and out, is the situations of inmates leaving the halfway house, is that under any federal investigation? Under, beg and, your pardon? Any federal investigation of the situation of the inmates going in and out of the halfway house? Not that I'm aware of, ma'am. Has there been an investigation completed on the halfway house? It's currently under investigation by the Guam Police Department. They're doing both investigation, the criminal side as well as the in internal affairs side. Okay, and are there, there going to be recommendations to fix that? Uh, yes, we hope so once we get the findings. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, Senator Trelawney. When you suggested that uh, the governor declare a state of emergency for Department of Corrections, what, what did you have in mind? What is it exactly that you want a state of emergency to address? So when the issue, when that was brought up uh, in one of our meetings, it was uh, the state of emergency or the emergency um, uh, recruitment was to waive some of the um, processes so that we could get them on board quicker, which I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm talking about waiving the polygraph, waiving the background investigation and the psyche valve so that we can move them forward. Okay. And so, um, because you have 35 vacancies without any need for additional funding, you could fill 35 if you could just get those things waived. You've got um, 19 have to go through the academy, 10 you're going to select uh, soon from a list. They're testing. What, ha what took so long? What, did, what was DOA's explanation uh, for beginning the process in January and not giving you the eligibility list until September, if it was uh, on an ongoing basis. So what was told to me, ma'am, was um, there was the written test that had to be performed. And so it wasn't just DOC that they were working on, there was other agencies. And then um, the issue of waiving the English and the math uh, requirement that was another issue that was delaying it as well because you needed to get the, pass the English test in order to um, take the written test or something but to that was, effect. When was that changed? Just maybe over the summer? 
Just this year. It just changed this no, year, know, which we brought to year. the post. Right. We brought to the post, and then the post agreed, and then they let DOA know, and then DOA was able to move us forward uh, in that respect. But it was a written test that they had to wait to do, and then once that was done, then they had to do the physical test. Um, what about the hiring of candidates who had already completed the training at GCC? That, that was a suggestion, and, and that hasn't come to fruition yet. We're still trying to work on something to be creative and for those purposes. So do you believe that DOA has assisted you, you know, it, to be creative, to come up with the most uh, fast-track way of hiring that you can at this point? Yes, ma'am. Uh, starting in, in September when we got the first list, and then thereafter we... Uh, we were getting a second list. I was just told today we're getting a second list that hopefully, I, would, I'm, I want to say between 24 and 32, I'm not quite sure. And then they have 84 that are pending to start, to, that will be taking the written test and then they're moving forward on the physical test. So that would be an, an additional list. So they're moving it forward in terms of the continuous announcement. So they're, they're vetting them as they come in. So we're getting some established lists, which is good news for us because then we're able to do those interviews and try and move them forward. So they're establishing the lists now um, quicker than nine months. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. So, well, that's good news. And it's good news that um, I, I understand you're going to continue to have vacancies, so you can, you're just going to have to continue that process, as Major Kirigua said. But, um, all right. And you're saying that it's the post that is requiring the polygraph and what was the other one I, f I forgot the um the background investigation the polygraph yeah the those are all posts psyche eval the urinalysis as well as and doa could find no way around that for temporary like uh, you know just the timing of it because the i from, from what was explained to me it's a post law mm -hmm. which we have to comply with all right and so i am i don't know how to ask this question but um, so you're going to be getting, let's say, 35 employees in the, in the next few months. Uh, these are unseasoned officers, of course. And so, I mean, I know you need, you need people, but I guess, uh, do you think you need more than that? Like, do you need experienced people? And, I mean, is it that critical right now? Or do you think that's going to take care of your needs? Uh, they, they can be trained uh, quick enough to really be effective. Well, ideally, we would, um, people who had some trainings would be ideal, and uh, so we would just hope whatever list that we get, that um, hopefully some of them have the, some background that will assist them when they do get out, come on board. So I want to elaborate on the 19, ma'am. So the 19 that we selected, be mindful that out of the 19, they still have to pass each criteria in order to be selected. If they fail any of those criteria, anything, then they're not eligible. So the list, I would have to interview again to continue to fill that, to get the 35. I know you weren't there at the time, but um, sometime in the last year or two, the, uh, the governor at that time had assigned some police officers to, to the perimeter, I think, of DOC is how they explained it. And I guess I'm trying to remember, what was the situation at that time that required those police officers to be up there? Were, was it a shortage similar to this or a shortage more extreme than this or something else besides the internal investigation? I would defer to Zero Two to answer that as a police officer. I'm sure he can elaborate further. Thank you. I was the commander of uh, Derdu Precinct that was shut down at the time to uh, assist in uh, the manpower issues that were that was going on up at the uh, DLC and um, <clears throat> of course I didn't agree you know for the manpower to be uh, you know shuffled that way um, however I, I believe the, the the reason or the rationale behind that uh, move was because of the shortage and the accumulation of uh, overtime that they wanted to cut down was the shortage similar to what it is right now? Does anyone know? How does that situation compare to today? We're actually worse today. Uh, uh, at one point, I think it was 2017, we had about 220 officers. We're down, again, now to 160. 
At the time GPD came in, we were probably a little over 200 officers when GPD came in, but again, we're a lot worse today. All right, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I'd like to just say, so I believe the last recruitment was in 2017, and we haven't hired anybody since then, 2017. Uh, we spoke earlier about having some kind of um, fast track process in order to get our officers on board. So uh, even an idea was also emergency certification where we can get these individuals who have gone, who have completed and have a certificate from GCC to be emergency certified so that we could bring them on board quicker. So that was another idea. But um, Vice, Vice Speaker, that, that's something that I will put, move forward and document in black and white. And uh, I think if we have a face plan to show the, yes, the post that this is what we need and we need uh, guidance or an agreement that this is where we're going to go and then also with DOA so that they can streamline and prioritize DOC and then perhaps I don't know we, you think we can detail GPD to go man the uh, visitor centers so that you have more personnel over there can you create an MOU MOA so that when you have these kind of extreme shortages that you know GPD can assist and perhaps they can call their personnel that are off and ask if they can go over to the, to the prison to assist them in the visitor center? I think there's manpower shortage all the way around as well as for GPD. So if we do any kind of emergency certification or any kind of change to the post law, that's going to benefit them as well, as, as well as all other law enforcement. But in terms of asking GPD to come and do it, if the chief of police would be so kind and he would allow his individuals to come and assist us, then we would gladly accept it. Yeah, so maybe you create an MOU, MOA, so, you know, they're, they're a phone call away. Yes, ma'am. I, I know that there's commitment also for GPD to get more recruits. I'm, yes. I'm hearing that. It's the same process, for the delay for them. Months, right? Yes, so I was just about to say that, the, you know, the issue with GPD is very similar, you know, with the manpower issues. and. It's just a different, you know, um, scenario, right? Because the OC is in, in a facility as opposed to the OC, I mean, a GPD, you know, manning, you know, uh, or patrolling out there. But the shortage is pretty much the same. I understand. And, and the process, the process, we're, we're, we're all in the same classification as far as peace officers, right, mm -hmm. on the, uh, with post. So... Um, those requirements that we that we keep uh, bringing up, uh, just to clarify, we're not. Uh, we didn't ask to to uh, waive that completely because we can't. You cannot. Yes, I know it's, that. It's up front right. that we're asking for it to be waived, but maybe throughout the the process, uh, maybe we can get these guys, uh, the candidates in already in the door, you know, uh, and then. They, uh, while they're going through the, the academy, they can vet them with those uh, requirements. Okay. That's, yes, and so I understand that GPD also has shortages, but if you create an MOU and an MOA, or maybe um, an executive order can be done, that, so that if there's anything that you, if this, the safety of the officers are at risk and GPD has personnel law that would go like to give time to DOC, and of course get paid, then you already have the mechanism in place to do it just through a simple phone call. So it's not something that has to be debated back and forth. And, you know, I'm not feeling good today, so I'm not going to give you some of my officers. Or my officers are complaining last time, so I'm not going to give you some of my officers. No, it's a, an agreement that when we need, you will try, you will try to help us. And if you, if you can't find officers, you can't find officers. But you will call the officers up and help and see if they can come in I don't know, do some work. That's it's something you want to consider because this is, this is, this is your foxhole, right? If you, the safety of the officers at risk, the morale is low. Um, I, people don't want to come to work anymore. So I'm worried about what might happen in the future. Yeah, and it's so very that's, limited that's, on that's how you call. can, it's and very limited on how you can use police officers on Right, that's why I said the visitor center possibly. like you did when last term. I didn't say to put them in the prison, right. I said the visitor center. I just wanted to, uh, to yes. let you know that though, because. I know, because I went there and I understood the dynamic of it.
I'd like to say, if I may, that um, uh, for the record, I'm not blaming DOA uh, for any of these the, um, delays and stuff. Of course, a lot of this by statute, as you are aware. But I do have a question. Is there a way that you could give authority to the governor or this body can give authority to the governor to waive some of these uh, requirements? Well, that's why, that sounds like a prepared question. Um, that is why I'm asking you to identify these things so we can start, start addressing the statute change, right? Okay. And if, if the governor needs something to help us to help you get more recruits, and if the body feels that it is something that will help the DOC and not hinder or not pose a risk to the community, then yes, right? This is something I'm saying, this is something that I'm, I want to work to do because you have your officer's safety uh, as an issue here, as a concern. Okay, so just those, those items, right? We're gonna work together, we're gonna meet posts, we're gonna see if we can address the statute change. Um, and I'm going to ask for a special session. And then on Sunday, you're going into five and two. We need to do something leadership to address the morale. Okay, so um, I'm going to be in connection with you, Major Uggen. I'm still waiting on the rules and regs so we can help you address something new because the rules and regs are outdated. So DOC needs that rules and regs that the command staff has worked with last term and maybe uh, instead of reinventing the wheel, the governor can take these rules and regs and make it something concrete. I'm sure there are a lot of improvements in the recommended rules and regs that you have, um, but we need to address the, the morale of the officers as well. So leadership, can you please do something about that and maybe we can have a round table meeting during the Christmas season, right? Because it's Christmas coming up and we wanna make sure that they're taken care of, the families are taken care of as well. So uh, I believe we exhausted all the concerns on the, uh, the, the, at least the, the very top layer of the concerns, right? And we'll, of course, we're gonna keep in close communication and if we have to have another round table or hearing, then I'll let you know. It is now 1901, this oversight hearing is now adjourned, thank you. <laughs>